Hello, I'm Philip Pound Baker and welcome to part two of COVID cryptography. So we're all locked down here for six months. We might as well learn something while we're at it. And so since I uh, work as a cryptographer, I thought I would, uh, or rather a designer of cryptographic protocols, I thought I'd produce a course on cryptography. In the first module, I talked about work factor and showed how work factor is really the thing that distinguishes the modern field from what went before. Um, work factor put the field on a mathematical basis and really pr provides us with a, uh, a bright line between uh, modern cryptography and the armchair puzzle uh, era. So uh, in this presentation, I'm going to be looking at a particular cryptographic function called a message digest. And it turns out to be one of the most useful cryptographic functions, despite the fact that it is pretty much the only major cryptographic function that doesn't involve a key. In, last, uh, we, in the last episode, I talked about the Enigma machine and how it uses a key to encrypt and decrypt. Well, message digests don't involve a key. And so how can you do encryption without a key? Well, there's more to en cryptography than encryption and decryption. Message digests are an integrity control. And the, the summary here is that SHA-2, if you're designing a cryptographic app, uh, application or using need a message digest or a cryptographic hash for any reason, the two that you should be looking at first and foremost these days are SHA-2 and SHA-3. Those are the industry standards that we are most confident in. Uh, there are a few others that we've that also look pretty good, but SHA-2 and SHA-3 are the go-to algorithms, and we've got good reason to be confident of the security of both. I'll come into that uh, a bit later. Now, in this presentation, I'm not going to be going into a deep dive into the differences between the two or how a message digest function works. Uh, I'll leave that to a bit later because we really need to see the um, algorithms in application before you can understand the reason why SHA-3 has certain advantages over SHA-2 and so on. Uh, one little policy point I'd like to make at this point is that at the moment pretty much the entire crypto industry runs on SHA-2 um, and it's not just our go-to digest function it's pretty much our only one that is widely supported. And we're now long time past the time when we should also be deploying SHA-3 as a backup. Okay, so that's the summary over. Uh, let's uh, get stuck in. So, we've got no key. Uh, what's that about? Well, encryption is important, but it's only one type of cryptographic control. And in the industry, we often like to talk about CIA. No, not that CIA. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And the thing is that in the field, whereas you know, most people get really excited about confidentiality and keeping things secret, and they see that as the, you know, the, the big goal of cryptography. Well, it isn't. Most confidentiality is really important, but Almost always, integrity is more important. Now think about it, you, you're going to your bank and uh, somebody's seen your statement and they've published it on the internet. Okay, so everybody knows how much money you've got and what you're spending on embarrassing things. That's bad. But it isn't quite as bad as somebody takes $20,000 out of your account and you can't prove that it wasn't you. You know, because then you're out $20,000. The first is a confidentiality attack. The second is an integrity attack. And I think most of us would be much more upset at losing the $20,000 than the loss of privacy. Availability goes further. And that is keeping, making sure that you keep your information assets, that you can keep accessing your information services. And this doesn't sound like a big impact until you start to think about, well, what is ransomware? You know, there, there's this malware that 
uh, downloads from the internet onto a machine and then encrypts all the files on the machine and then demands a ransom unless the person to release the key. Well, that's a ransomware attack. And fundamentally, it's an attack on the availability of the data. And, you know, for most people, okay, having their bank details uh, printed, you know, the confidentiality attack is bad. The integrity attack, the loss of money is worse. But, you know, if you lose your pictures of your uh, children when they're five, you're not going to be able to replace them 10 years later because they're never going to be five again. Well, you can have more children, of course, but, you know, that's an expensive uh, solution. And so that's why ransomware is such a pernicious uh, attack. And so it's not just it's not just a question about confidentiality being the one thing we worry about. We have to worry about all three. And integrity is usually a bigger concern than confidentiality and availability is usually the biggest concern of the lot consider what would happen if one of the biggest banks in the country suddenly lost track of all its uh bank records on computer you know there was an earthquake or a fire or whatever and they just didn't know which money belonged to whom yeah that would not just wipe out that bank it could wipe out the entire economy because you know, nobody would be able to know how much, you know, nobody would be able to withdraw the money on from their account because the bank wouldn't know how much they uh, had put there. And so uh, an availability attack can be the most serious of them all. Okay, so what is a message digest? Well, a message digest is an integrity control. And to understand the importance, let's just look at what digital documents are. Every digital document consists of a sequence of numbers. Uh, it could be a short sequence or a long sequence, but it's basically a sequence of numbers. Text, spreadsheets, web pages, images, videos, they're all sequences of numbers. And computers take those sequences and have a particular set of rules called a format that causes the computer to interpret that sequence of numbers as sounds, images, text and so on. And so JPEG and GIF are formats for images. Uh, HTML is a format for documents that combine text and images. But under the covers, everything is just a stream of numbers. And that stream of numbers will determine what appears on your screen, what you hear, and you know, what transactions take place on the bank. You know, it all comes down to just strings of numbers. Now, modern computers, you know, this wasn't always the case, but modern computers have settled on using sequences of 8-bit numbers. And, you know, 8, eight bits, you know, 2 to the power 8 is a nice round number in computer terms, and we call that a byte, and a byte is an integer between 0 and 255. And an email will typically be a few thousand or tens of thousands of bytes, an image can be a few hundred thousand bytes. Uh, and a video, well, the first two videos in this sequence, uh, those are uh, around 10 billion bytes. And so, you know, these sequences can get pretty long. And that can present us with a problem. So let's say that you're wanting to, uh, well, let's take the Oxford English Dictionary here. And so we want to see whether our electronic copy of the electronic in of the Oxford English Dictionary is correct. Okay, um, we could compare every word one for one, but you know, that's gonna take a long time, it's a big book. What, uh, and we also have to have, in order to check whether our copy is correct, we have to have another reference copy the same size. So, you know, it's not a very useful or convenient check. What a message digest allows us to do is to compress and scrunchulate that very large, long sequence of bytes down to a short sequence of 16, 32 or 64 bytes, depending upon which particular message digest we use. And that's basically what a message digest is about. And these can be te terrifically useful um, you know, because Comparing two videos to make sure that they're the exact same video and one hasn't been modified, you know, uh, downloading a second copy would take you an awfully long time. 
uh, comparing the digest, much more convenient. And you know, this question about whether an attacker has modified something can be a real concern in computer security. This happened when, um, you know, when I was a student, I was sponsored by a company called the Digital Equipment Corporation, and they were attacked by a hacker called Kevin Mitnick. And, you know, he wasn't actually quite as smart as he claimed. You know, Mitnick's strength was always convincing people that he was clever and smart rather than being clever and smart. You know, he didn't kind of like look at the way the computer system worked and work out a really crafty way of breaking into the computer. No, what he did was he hacked into the voicemail of the chief security guy at Digital and every time somebody called up and said hey we've got a security problem and this is how it how the attack works mitnick would listen in to that uh, voicemail and that would give him enough information to be able to reverse engineer the attack and duplicate it and then attack digital and so that's what he did he got into the digital corporate network and once he was there well digital knew that he'd got in but they didn't know what he'd done when he was inside. And so the biggest cost of what Mitnick did to DEC wasn't what he did directly, but the fact that they couldn't trust any of their systems, so they had to reinstall the operating system on every machine in the company. And in those, and this is the mini uh, age of computing, and you know those machines were not very fast, and the tape drives weren't very fast either. Um, you know, we still used to get programs on nine track, track tape and so you'd have a stack of them and, you know, it would take you uh, maybe 15, mi 15 minutes to do each one and uh, reinstalling the operating system, we were talking about, you know, that was a full day job to bring a system back up and Digital had 10,000 of them in the company. So bringing back every computer system online, making sure that it wasn't contaminated by Mitnick, you know, that put the whole company out of business for uh, over a week. You know, that was many millions of dollars. You know, that put uh, Mitnick in jail for five and a half years. So integrity can be a real serious concern. And we'll see how we can use Message Digest to mitigate that attack uh, circumstance uh, later on. Okay, so Message Digest functions, they, they've had multiple names over the years. They're also known as hash functions, cryptographic hashes, fingerprints, and one-way functions. But you know, the term of art that we've chosen for them in the field is a Message Digest function. And they're not just used on their own. In a later video, I'm also going to be showing how we use Message Digest function to construct other cryptographic um, functions. Uh, message authentication codes and key derivation functions. They're both important cryptographic functions that are based on message digests, uh, but we'll come to those later on. Now, message digests have been really important in the field, but they've got a really problematic history because it basically took us quite a while to understand how, how important they were, what sort of properties they needed, and it took us even longer to work out how to design them right. And one of the reasons for that was that we didn't quite understand how the cryptograph the operations we're using to construct the message digest, we didn't know how those translated into a work function. And so there have been quite a lot of broken message digests over time. MD2, MD4, MD5, SHA1 are all widely used message digest functions from the past that have since been broken. And some of them, they've even been broken more than once, and I'll get to how that's possible uh, in, in a while. So, um, the, his, the modern history, of, so a digest function is a form of hash function, and those are even earlier. Uh, in fact, they come from really the birth of uh, modern computing. The very first edition, first edition of the first volume of ACM Transactions, uh, one of the papers there is a translation of an earlier paper, originally paper printed in Russian, that describes a hash function. What does a hash function do? Well, it takes an arbitrary input, 
and produces a fixed length output. And they are one of the most useful and most fundamental structures in computer science. They're the basis for Google. They're how Google works. Uh, you couldn't possibly have a search engine that was working by searching through every document on the web in real time. What Google does is it reduces those documents to a stream of hash functions and it has various structures that sort and collate and index and cross-reference and provide a way of going from a hash of the query to the documents that are being referenced by that query really quickly. And so you know, we can come back to uh, how Google works or how search engine works later on, but you know, underneath hash functions are one of the most critical uh, pieces of um, operation. Now they're also used in digital signatures and in cryptography and in particular we discovered that we needed them uh, when a particular uh, system called a, mess a digital signature was uh, created. Uh, now the thing there was that um, we, a mess I'll get to what a digital signature is a bit later, but uh, it's basically providing an integrity control that involves a key. And that's all I say for, for now. And the thing is that they're really useful, but they're a bit slow. Or rather, they only pr you can do them in you know, a few tens of milliseconds, which you know, is pretty fast. You know, tens of mini a, tenth, a hundredth of a second, you're not going to notice that. But the thing is that the signature algorithm itself is only really um, providing an authentication of a few bits, you know, uh, 256 bits, 448 bits, uh, maybe a thousand bits. But it's a really short message that they can sign at one time. So it's quickly realized that it's going to be impractical to process the entire input with the digital signature we've got to find a way of reducing that input first so that we can sign it. And so we're going to need a hash function. But we're going to need a hash function of a very particular type. And in fact, we're going to want a hash function that is quite distinct from some of the hash functions that we used before. If you're trying to compare two images for equality, you know, you wanted to see, you know, is this image from the web the same as that? Well, you want, might want to have the match to be somewhat fuzzy, you know, so that uh, you want to you want to see that the two images are the same, even though one's been resized, one's been cropped and so on. And, you know, producing fuzzy matches in hashes turns out to be quite a challenge. With cryptography, we want to go to absolutely the opposite side and be able to say these two images are different even if they are different by one pixel or one character or even just one bit. You know, we want to be absolutely certain that they're absolutely identical in every possible way. And so generating a cryptographic hash is turned out to be difficult. So there are two ways that we can specify the properties of Cryptographic Digest. Now, I'll do it informally first and then I'll explain how we, we specify that with a bit more mathematical clarity. So the first property we want is we want them to be deterministic. So that if we take the digest of a message or a document or whatever, the same input is always going to produce exactly the same output. So that's deterministic. We want it to be a one-way function. That is, we want it to be easy to compute the hash of the input, but we want it to be really computationally prohibitive to go the other way and to work out the input from the output. And finally, we want to have it such that changing just one bit in the input should change absolutely every bit in the output. And so that particular function turns out to be quite hard to um, 
really be confident of. Now, mathematically, we reduce these to three criteria. The first and the strongest criteria is called pre-image resistance. And that says that given a value H hash of m, so given a result of a function, it should be infeasible to find an input that produces that output. And this is also called inverting the hash. And so that's pre-image resistant and that's the hardest test to make. The second one is called second pre-image resistance. And that says that given a message, it should be infeasible to find a second message whose digest is the same as the first. So I fix an input and the attacker has to find an, a second input that produces the same output as the first. And then finally, it should be collision resistant. And that says that it should be infeasible to find any two inputs that produce the same output. And these are really uh, ranked in terms of difficulty. Pre-image resistance, inverting the hash function, yeah, that's, that's the hardest one. Second pre-image resistance, that's a bit easier. Collision resistance, uh, that is the, usually the easiest attack to meet. And so it's also what we like to see as kind of like the sentinel attack. You know, collision resistance doesn't necessarily have an impact on a cryptographic application that uses a message digest function. But as soon as we see a collision resistance attack on a message digest function, or even something that's getting close to being a collision resistance attack, that's the point at which we stop look using that message digest function and start looking for a replacement. You know, it's the canary in the coal mine. If a collision resistance uh, attack has, is possible, we've got problems. Now, I'm reducing this to math, and so you're probably also expecting me to talk about work factor. And of course I will, because, and here's where me message digest become uh, problematic. You see, now there's no key, so, you know, how do we get the, you know, there's only an output. So we don't t define the work factor in terms of the size of the key. We talk about it in terms of the size of the output. And you might think, well, if we've got 128 bits of output, that means that our work factor is going to be 2 to the power 128, and we're going to be great. Right? Well, yeah, no, not really. And this is where the distinction between the attacks comes in that, uh, yeah, the work factor is 2 to the power 128 for some of those attacks, but not for the collision attack. And this is because of something called the birthday attack. And the way that the reason it's called the birthday attack is, say we've got a room full of 20 people. What is the probability that two people in the room have the same birthday? And you might be thinking, well, 20 people, 365 days in the year, that's going to be, you know, 1 in 18. That's going to be pretty improbable, right? Well, no, actually, it's better than evens. In fact, it's quite a bit better than evens. Uh, the probability of uh, having two people with the same birthday is 50% if the if you've got the square root of 365 people in the room. And this is just the sad thing about uh, collision attack, because the thing is that we're not looking for a match for one particular input. We're match looking for a match between two randomly chosen inputs. So the more inputs that we have, it's not just a question about if A matches B, it's a match question of whether, not just a question of about seeing if something matches A. It's a question of seeing whether A matches B or A matches C or B matches C and so on. It's all the different permutations and that goes up with the square of the number of items in the room, of course. And so the birthday attack means that the difficulty of that uh, collision attack goes up with the square root 
of the size of the output. What does that mean in practice? Well, square to calculate the square root of something, that's x to the half, and so uh, 2 to the power 128 becomes 2 to the power 128 divided by 2, that becomes 64. So we've only got 2 to the power 64 possibilities. Now, in the early 1990s, when MD4 and MD5 were being developed, uh, that wasn't a, you know, that was quite a lot of uh, different possibilities. It's not today, you know, computers have got bigger, they've got much bigger storage capacities. We have billions and billions and billions of digital documents on the web, and so a probability of collision of 2 to the power 64 is no longer acceptably secure. You can find collisions on uh, MD4 and MD5, you know, it's getting close to being able to find them by brute force. Well, you can find them by brute force now. So we, needed to, we need to have bigger um, message digest functions. I'll come to that a, a, a bit later. Okay, so what can we do with message digest functions? Well, we can use them to create what's called a fingerprint. Uh, there was a time when we kind of like called a message digest function a fingerprint function, but these days we've kind of pretty much settled on using fingerprint to mean specifically a presentation of a message digest output. And the ones that you see mostly on the web are uh, a hex, hexadecimal uh, output of uh, a fingerprint value, uh, a message digest output. And that's okay, but you know, hexadecimal, well, that's base 16. Uh, so we only get four bits per out of each character. Um, I, 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 along with some others, I've been suggesting, well, we could produce something a bit better uh, if we used five bits per character, base 32. And we also want to make a few other changes. So, if you, if you go to the Raspberry Pi download function, you will see um, they give the fingerprint of all the operating system images that they offer. And that's pretty useful because, you know, if you've got binary download, you've got an unreliable line. If your operating system ends up corrupted after you've downloaded it, well, uh, that's a pretty serious problem that you've got there. And so you'd like to have a good checksum there to make sure that you've not downloaded something that's corrupted. And so they provide you with the message digest function so that you can be sure that your operating system hasn't been corrupted. And that's good. But there's also the other problem of, you know, what if a malicious attacker had come in and corrupted the operating system download? And, you know, you, you often see message digests, you know, fingerprints, being presented as a solution to that problem. Uh, actually, when you think about it, no, they're not, because the provenance of the fingerprint isn't any better than the provenance of the download that you're comparing it to. If an attacker could modify one, they could modify the other on the same site. And so it's a useful uh, control, useful integrity control, it's not a useful security control. Now, what is a useful security control is a system called Tripwire, which was originally developed by Gene Spafford and, G and his student Gene Kim. And what that does is it, you run it on your machine and it goes through all the files on the machine and it takes a fingerprint of every file in every directory and it produces a big list of them all. And then you can take that list of fingerprints, store it somebody else, somewhere else. So you've got provenance on the list. And you can then be sure, and they, then if you think that the machine might have been compromised, you will every night you check the machine against the list of fingerprints and you can see which files have been changed. And obviously, you probably want to have a few filters on there because, you know, there's some directories that contain uh, files that you know are going to be changed. But you know what, if somebody has changed the uh, operating system boot image, well, you know, you've been pretty seriously hacked. And so this is a good way of assuring yourself that the machine that you're using hasn't been tampered with. 
and I used this system myself when I was installing a system at the executive office of the president uh, when I was uh, and uh, basically we ended up with the um, the list of the fingerprints were on the machine itself and then we put the fingerprint of that list of fingerprints that sat on a floppy disk that was in the machine and had the right tab uh, set so that it couldn't be overwritten and that ran every night to make sure that nobody had changed the uh, settings of that machine and so uh, nobody was sending out fake uh, press releases from the President of the United States which would have been bad Okay, another use for message digests is uh, to store password databases. Now, pretty early on in the history of computing, I don't think it was Unix, I think it was a bit before Unix, we realised that having a list of all the passwords of the user of the machine on the machine was a bad plan. And so people started using the hash of the uh, password instead of the password itself and so uh, and this was improved I'll, I'll get to how that was happened uh, in a later system when we look at password security uh, that was improved on the Unix system uh, they introduced what was called the soft and we can get into how that's good uh, and so using one-way functions to of the passwords rather than the passwords themselves still allows us to check if the user has presented the right password to the system but doesn't allow somebody who's got access to that system to see what everybody's password is. Now that's not the same thing as making passwords secure and this has been one of the longest running arguments in computer security. You know, I'm sorry but there is no secure way of using passwords. None. Zip. Nada. There are no amount of fancy uh, characters you can force people to use. There's no amount of upper and lower case. No. None. Doesn't work. The longest password that a human can be expected to memorize is much, much shorter than the shortest password that is actually secure. That's just a fact, sorry. And you can't get around it. And we'll come to you know, the blow by blow account of why that is the case in another video probably, uh, or maybe a series of videos because you know, I'm sorry, but password security just ain't security. Okay, so let's look at a brief history of where message digests come from. A message digest attack. Well the first modern message digest uh, is a system that was called MD4 which was designed by Ron Rivest using a construction called Merkle Damgard uh, that had been recently proposed and MD4 was a really interesting cipher for a number of reasons uh, that I'll get into uh, a bit later. Uh, MD4 was you know well received but a lot of people said well you're not doing quite enough cryptography. We'd like you to see you do a bit more cryptography. Uh, instead of putting, processing all this data three times, let's do it four times. Uh, and another group of people said, well, this is good, but you've only got a 128-bit output. That's not going to be enough for our security needs. We're going to need at least uh, a collision resistance, at least uh, two to the power 80. So we want to have a larger output. And so this led to two things. Ron uh, revised his MD4 proposal to produce MD5, which was stronger. And the National Security Agency of the US government uh, took uh, MD4, took the same basic construction. And instead of having four registered, they added a fifth register and they added more rounds and they added what, uh, and that produced what was called SHA-0. And then just before SHA-0 was actually released, was actually blessed as a NIST standard, there was a revision to it that came up that, called, that produced what was called SHA-1. And this revision, you know, there were lots of theory, conspiracy theories at the time, but uh, we didn't really find out the reason for that until 1995, 
when Hans Dobertin published an attack on MD5. He had a compression attack on a slight variation of MD5 there. And he shared that with Ron and Ron shared it with me and because uh, I had the office down the hall from him at the time and I was working at the web consortium on crypto. And so um, when we looked into the details of how Dobertine's attack on MD5 worked, and then we looked at the difference between SHA0 and SHA1, we discovered, well, this little expansion function that they've added in, yeah, that seems to disrupt this attack that Dobertine had found. And so the NSA had made that adjustment to SHA1 and had actually made it more secure, not less as some of the conspiracy minded people accused. So 95, uh, so 95 was uh, seriously compromised. You know, we, we weren't at the point where actual running implications like the web were being compromised at this point, but you know, we pretty soon stopped using MD5 as a message digest function, we just switched to SHA-1. But some of us were still uncomfortable because SHA-1 shared the same basic Merkle Damgaard construction and you know, they're, they're all from the same family. And uh, this led to NSA publishing, uh, or rather NIST publishing, a revision to SHA-1 developed by the NSA, uh, which is SHA-2. And uh, that took the same basic construct, but increased the number of registers from five to eight, instead of having a uh, 250, uh, 160 bits of output, it's now 256, and it produces a much, much better uh, cipher. And so uh, SHA-2 uh, was published in 2001, and people started looking at it and saying, well, you know, should we be doing this? But by and large, everybody was happy uh, until the RSA conference in 2005, when Adi Shamir, that's the S from RSA, uh, uh, announced some results from a Chinese uh, cryptography group, Wang Yao and Yao, who had a, an attack that significantly reduced the difficulty of attacking SHA-1. They weren't at, they didn't actually have enough computing power to break SHA-1 at that point, but the results that they had proved that they could break it in much less than a brute force attack. And so at this point, uh, we started to get really worried. And I was at the conference and I saw the presentation and immediately afterwards I saw sought out Bill Burr, who was the head of the crypto program at the National Institute of Standards and say, hey, you know what, Bill, we need to have a crypto competition to find a successor for SHA-2. You know, SHA-2, uh, we, we were fairly happy about it before, but you know, it's from the same family as SHA-1, we've got to understand whether it's secure or not, and we have to have a replacement ready just in case it's not. And, Bill was really reluctant because he just spent 10 years doing the AS competition. So, yeah. Anyway, end of Friday of the uh, conference, I met up with Bill again and he's saying, yeah, Phil, it looks like we're going to have to do a crypto competition for Message Digest because, you know, and the thing was that in between, all my colleagues, you know, I was principal scientist at VeriSign at the time, but all my colleagues from Microsoft, IBM, uh, Google, you know, they'd all come and done the same thing and you know they were all unhappy as well and so NIST started this uh, message digest successor the sh what was, became the SHA-3 competition um, and you know that 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 was uh, a, a big uh, big industry effort and in 2012 they announced a winner and the reason I tell this uh, story is uh, basically to back down some of the conspiracy theories that float around in the scheme. You know, the reason that NIST produced the SHA-3 competition and you know, worked on developing the algorithm for the industry was because the industry asks them to produce it. And you know, it was because m myself and you know, a dozen other people who were all senior crypto people at the leading crypto companies uh, said, you know, this is important to our business, please 
please start working. And you know, the winner of that competition, you know, although it was the US Institute of Standards, it was not a US company. Um, I think it was Dutch, Kekak. Okay, so uh, by 2008, um, people were already starting to get sufficiently worried about Sha Wan that they were saying, don't bother bidding on this proposal unless you support SHA-2. And I think the first uh, RFP of that type that I saw was in 2008, when Cable Labs told uh, us that uh, we needed SHA-2 if we were going to bid on their certificates. Now, things kind of like went along fairly slowly until 2014, when the CA Browser Forwards uh, Forum suddenly voted to phase out SHA-1 effective in on 1st of January 2017. And this kind of like annoyed me. I mean, you know, for all those years I've been saying we got to be moving from SHA-1 to SHA-2 and then they say no no it's okay we can wait we can wait and then suddenly it's oh we've got to do it and we've got to do it in three years. Yeah um, well that's just the way things happen. Now the reason that uh, they were that worried was that um, in 2015, uh, a free start collision was uh, shown on SHA-1. Uh, and what the free, free start collision mean is that if you unpack the algorithm, uh, there are a few things that happen to the inputs before they happen. And they had a, co a collision function on the interior module of SHA-1. And that pretty much showed that, yes, People were getting very, very close to breaking SHA-1, and that happened in, in 2017 when Google uh, published the shattered attack on SHA-1 that absolutely broke the system. And then just recently, a few months ago, an even further attack has uh, been shown that uh, does a second pre-image attack. So the, 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 so the security of SHA-1 was a concern, but, you know, the good thing is that we monitored that concern, we curated the crypto as, the industry, as an industry, and we withdrew it from use um, three years before it became a really serious concern. I'd have liked to have withdrawn it earlier, but, you know, you don't always get the... Um, thing. So are we safe? Well, yes. I mean, like, as far as the web PKI is concerned, you know, the web PKI hasn't allowed um SHA-1 certificates for quite a while and the attack the second pre-image attack uh is still pretty expensive it costs eleven thousand dollars per attack and you know there aren't that many things that are worth spending eleven thousand dollars to attack online that you couldn't attack in other ways for much less but it's also not really acceptable because even though SHA-1 is not being used in the web PKI, it's still used in countless other systems underneath the covers, and you don't always know what those systems are, and sometimes you, know, you have a system that can be upgraded to use a newer and better uh, algorithm, but hasn't been. And this comes back to one of my bugbears, which is you don't actually get any more security from introducing a new crypto system. In fact, adding SHA-2 to a system doesn't make it more secure. It makes it less secure because now you've got two algorithms that could be broken. The only way that you get more security by adding new crypto is if you stop using the old, broken, suspect crypto. That's what gives you better security. The reason that you deploy new crypto algorithms is so that you can get rid of the old algorithms. In general, uh, most crypto systems, the ideal as far as I'm concerned is to have two cryptographic algorithm primitives for each function. So you have one to use for production, one that's a hot spare in case something goes wrong. If you go to three, well, that can be okay. But if you go to 20, 30, 40, the chance that something might be bad increases. So I would like to see us starting to deploy SHA-3 now 
because, so that we have that hot spare on the shelf, pre-deployed in case something bad happens to SHA-2. So today, the two go-to message digest functions of choice are SHA-2 and SHA-3. SHA-2 is the one that is widely supported. SHA-3 is not widely supported yet, but should be. It's time it was. SHA-2 is based on the Merkle Damgard construction and the has lineage going back to MD4. So it's a very well understood approach. SHA-3 is based on a completely different construction called the sponge. And so that makes it a very different, uh, appro uh, different system. And it's unlikely that an attack in about on one is automatically going to uh, attack the other. And so that makes SHA-3 a very satisfactory hot backup to SHA-2. And so that's message digest functions. And so in this module, I described what they are. In the next module, I'm going to show you what we can do with them beyond tripwire fingerprints and so on. And in particular, that's when we're going to get to what I suspect a lot of people want to get to, which is what's all that deal with blockchain and Bitcoin anyway. So please like, please subscribe, and please stick around for the next module of COVID cryptography. After all, you know, we might be stuck here for six months. You know, might as well learn something. Thank you very much for watching and please take care.